So, thank you. Uh, my name is Jonas Lindemann. I'm a director of LUNARC, or the Center for Scientific Computing at Lund University. Uh, so I'm not going to talk so much about the data formats or uh, how to store data, but basically the data flows or data management and also somewhat how to store for a longer time, some visions and ideas about that. You have all have seen this, this uh, cycle, uh, and I'm going to cover some of these parts here, uh, uh, starting with the data management, which goes into the active research part, when, when, which we have been working a lot with the research groups within Lund University. So we focus first about capturing data, because that is something that is a problem that we have uh, uh, encountered several times. Uh, and it's, it's not easy and requires different solutions for different things. So one big example is the MAX4 uh, Synchrotron 2, uh, which has a lot of stations which capture data in different ways. And uh, that's one, one common thing is that there is a sensor that takes data and, and stores on, on, on disks and different parts. Uh, other data collectors is, uh, for example, the 7T uh, magnet for uh, MRI which uh, is a new machine which has even higher resolution than old machines, which produce even more data, which has to be handled somehow. Uh, ICOS, uh, Marianne's project, collects data as well, in different character, uh, different, different types of data than from the MRI scanners. Uh, also, bioinformatics, which we have been working a lot with lately, produce uh, have the data needs have been exploding the last years, so we are working with that as well. So uh, another field that also collects a lot of data uh, is uh, Humanities Lab from Marianne, which we've been working a lot to set up their kind of workflow with data, and that is from, from sensors, face uh, um, eye tracking, uh, but also lately 3D scanning, which has been a um, both computational and also storage-wise has been a, a thing that has been a new field for us at uh, the Supercomputing Center. Uh, but it's not only uh, sensors that collect data, so you also have uh, many, many researchers doing uh, simulations that generate data. So basically uh, you build a model and you simulate and that generates data. So here are some flow simulations and also a finite element model of the MAX4 site which has a lot of unknowns, and that also generates huge amounts of data that has to be handled. Uh, so you can see that you have, um, if you want to have data and storage needs, you know, the technical aspects of it, you have uh, data that can be uh, extremely volume and also uh, high speed coming in, so you have four gigabytes of data per second. Uh, you also have data that is perhaps less, but uh, takes longer to come in. Uh, you also have data that is that trickles in, but can be collected and, and takes a lot of time over, over, over many years. And, and you can have different kind of characteristics about this. So it comes in different chunks, it mixed. Uh, and that that's, uh, uh, puts a lot of uh, requirements on, on the storage facilities where, to catch the data. So for, for some extreme sensors, you, you, you really need to think about how to handle the data in, uh, uh, just to be able to catch it. So this is from a sensor, and you have really uh, advanced compute cluster behind to actually just a uh, storage cluster to, to catch it. And you have to really think about the network con the configurations and, and stuff like that. So it's a lot about hardware but also about software and, and also the technologies and uh, uh, to configure them in the correct ways to actually uh, take care of the data. But it can also be some simple things like this. So you have a, a sensor somewhere uh, operating on a Raspberry Pi collecting weather data. So you have all the spectra and you, you, you have to take care of that data somehow in different ways. Uh, of course, also you need to analyze the data this cycle, and then it's good to have the data close by, so you can do the anal analysis directly uh, on the data without moving the data between things. So uh, at Lunark, uh, this we provide an environment <coughs> where you can actually do this. 
So you, you, can, you can have the data at our site, and then you can do using uh, something called uh, remote uh, Lunar HPC desktop, which we, you can actually uh, run hardware accelerated visualization directly on your data in, your, in, in the data center. Uh, now move a bit about data management. So when you have come here, you have a lot of data, and you need to, that is some, some aspect we have been working a lot with this, this is the kind of what we see when we talk some some uh, some research project that we, I mean, <laughs> this is the data managed classic. You have a you see a researcher with desktops with all the files on the desktop, or they have a shelf somewhere with the, the data <laughs> uh, physically stored. <laughs> uh, you can have thumb drives with data. Uh, it's not a good thing. So it's this is what we call a data chaos, and we, that's something as, uh, we as a uh, center for high uh, performing computing and storage try to solve with the resource groups. So one thing is to organize the data. Just uh, try to create a structure of it, and I think there are experts here that are better than me to do that, but that is something uh, uh, it's important. Also, uh, who, who access the data and also who is authorized to, to access the data. So this is uh, one way of just trying to think, figure out this is for 7T project, creating a, a structured way of actually handling a lot of projects with all the data that is generated uh, and, and storing them in a shared kind of um, uh, file system and server to be able to access them later. Um, so some of the things we have been working on is, for example, in biomatics we are working currently to kind of handle data that is uh, sensitive data, uh, from a next generation sequencer uh, and to be able to compute and create a work environment where you have the data available and you can work with uh, uh, confidence that is not shared uh, or exposed in different ways. But also giving you the way of working in, that, in the way you want is to get the kind of normal desktop environment, all your tools you need, but also the compute power. So this is one solution we have been uh, developing together with Mauno here. So, uh, and some other people at uh, Bioinformatics in Lund. We also have been working with uh, Lund Bioimaging Center to create uh, a workflow solution with servers and uh, a way of going from the sensors to, to Lunac and doing computing. Uh, we've also been working with Max4 to actually do uh, the, the kind of scientific data management flow, the initial prototypes and design of that. So this, this was basically active data. So uh, the, my big, the big, big question I've been getting every, every, from a lot of researchers, and, and then what? So now I have done a lot of research, I have a lot of data, but for example, Lunark, we, we don't store anything uh, long-term. It's, it's basically active data we store. Uh, but the fact that we store a lot for a longer time, but we shouldn't. So there needs to be something that comes after the active part and also makes it some, somehow uh, useful and we're talking about the FAIR principle to be able to reuse the data again. So I'm going to do show, show my vision here um, from a more technical uh, background how I will see this working. So um, I've, I've pictured some of the flows that we see. It's for example sensors. Uh, they, they come in and we have some kind of active storage and that is transferred later to some kind of long-term storage. But it can be automatic flows and it can also be manual flows. We also have uh, what we see, the simulations. Uh, those can go uh, from, from simulation results to the active storage and back again, a couple iterations. And at some points, you want to move them to more, uh, to publish or to, to uh, archive and move it into some kind of longer-term storage. But then there are people that perhaps work with documents that want to go directly here. You don't have this kind of need for active storage where you work with data. You want to go directly to the long-term storage. You have these kind of flows coming in. So you need to create some kind of solution for, to handle all these kind of needs. So um, what we have been looking at is to try to figure out what uh, the university long-term storage solution should, should um, look like. And the parts that needs to be 
implemented for this is uh, what comes out after here. So some kind of this part here, going from storage, long-term storage archive to publication. And also being able to actually uh, search the data that has been stored somehow and also uh, aid in creating management plans for uh, research proposals later on. The research question, I mean, that becomes stored, so we, that is something we need to, uh, you have to work with. So uh, those parts are the things that we, are, we want to go into a long-term storage solution. Uh, so some of the goals that we have to think about is it has to be easy to use. Uh, it has to be extremely easy to use. Uh, it also has to be available and accessible in users' workflow. So uh, a solution needs to be able to plug into directly to where you store your data and move your data or um, access your data. It shouldn't be an alien thing that you need to adapt to. Uh, adaptable, I mean, it has to handle kind of all the storage needs you need. So it can be large data sets, small data sets, data sets with a huge amount of um, number of files, or perhaps a data set with just a few files. And then you have the kind of, kind of combinations of everything that you need to handle. Uh, and also some, some of the um, major goals that is important is that, I mean, let users want to use it instead of having require them to use it. I think that's a better thing. I mean, if I store my data here, I can do this and this and this, and that's really attractive for me. So that, that's one of the things we are, want to embed into this project. And also, of course, it has to be, you should be able to easily share your data in the system. And also findable, of course. So this is a combination of the FAIR principle and uh, some of the other hardware technical aspects that is important in a system like this. Uh, I probably forgot some of these, but you need to be able to access this storage in, in many different ways. So it goes from command line, desktop, web interfaces, uh, workflows, cloud storage, uh, also storage of source code file version control systems. I'm, I didn't put it here, but it's also important. Uh, so I'm just showing some of the things, I, ideas we have is uh, going from the low level here, terminal access, that which is very use, uh, used by our users at Lunark. You should have your long-term storage system somewhere really accessible in, uh, when you log into the system. It's there in a directory, a virtual directory or something. Also, when you're working on a desktop, it should be very easily accessible. Uh, there should be something here, storage, LULTS something, and then it, it has some folders with uh, automatically created for you when you start your employment here. There should be a predefined structure where you can put your d documents. So it should be very easily accessible and use, used. Of course, you should be able to use it from, from the web. Uh, without any client. Uh, you should also be able to have some kind of dedicated client that can provide metadata to your data. And also, there should be no client. So some, some data can be handled automatically. So if you have workflows or data collection, you should be integrated, this, this system should be integrated so the data will move automatically. So when you're done, you check a box somewhere in a web interface and the data is moved to long-term storage perhaps even automatically tagged because you have already provided your metadata to the data. To, to the data. Adaptable. I mean, it should be held, I was in before that, it should be handled different kind of uh, data streams. So uh, big streams, small streams, short streams, uh, coming from different kind of sources. Also important is that you have um, support for different protocols that you can so you can integrate the system in different ways. Uh, it's just some examples here, but there could be also the uh, source code repository uh, uh, storage as well. So we, you can actually store source code in a version format. So we have been looking, uh, I was impressed by the uh, previous talks here about this PER uh, system. There are other ones as well, but the idea of, of actually making a long-term storage system really attractive for users. So you can, uh, you can search your data sets, you can publish your data sets uh, in an easy way. To basically create some kind of uh, Facebook for data or Twitter. Uh, so you can get your kind of landing page for your project where you have your data in a really nice way. 
So you can, and, uh, when you um, link to that data, or you share your links or DOIs, you, you get to this kind of nice page. Uh, so you can describe your data, your collaborators, there are links to the data itself. Uh, also, instruction how to cite your data, uh, tagging your data. Uh, and also here, here's some data here. You also see there is versions of the source code available in the collaborators. Um, and also, it, it also needs to have this kind of support from, from the back end as well. So, uh, to be, and have an outreach to help users get into the system and, and uh, uh, aid them into to getting in. Because it's still, it can be, even if it's easy to use, it's still, you need to be able to have a fully supported system so that you, uh, researchers and, uh, feel confident about the system to use it. So we have started a small group here, with, and the project uh, is very user-focused. Uh, I mean, we, we don't want to build something that nobody wants, or uh, we want to build something that everybody can use. Uh, we have a project group here with uh, uh, Karl Lagerberg, Monica, Anders, Folin, and me. Uh, and we're starting to do user surveys and interviews. We already have done some of them, I think. Uh, and we wanted to have a small prototype for evaluation perhaps the end of 2018 or 2019. And then there will be larger implementation project coming uh, end of 2019 and stuff like that. Yeah. So that was my talk about long-term storage. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jonas. Hmm? Um, yep, there are some questions. Yeah, that's a very welcome initiative. I think mm. loads of people will find this extremely useful. I'm just a little bit worried about the, what I saw just now from your presentation, that there is a big focus on the individual user. What happens if a person leaves Lund University and is no longer employed? Who is then in charge of administrating the things? Or do, does the data need to be deleted maybe or moved because it should no longer be hosted by Lund? Uh, how do you deal with if somebody suddenly dies and then the, um, her or his colleagues can no longer access and update metadata, for instance? Mm. Uh, are you going to uh, deal with these issues as well? Hopefully. <laughs> uh, I have a microphone, so... Yeah. Uh, yes, that, that will be probably part of the system as well. That there, you have to define where ownership of the data somehow in the system as well. Uh, and I think there are some things in the system already to do that, in the, in the PER system at least. So, uh, but that's definitely a question we have to look into. <laughs> Hi. Yeah? Hi, I'm Nikolai Skok of Salaf Lab Bioinformatician. Uh, so, sorry, I don't have a question about storage, but about computations yeah. um, and analysis. So how much do you guys at Lunar use in-memory distributed computations like Apache Spark? Say, I have my data on different machines. I don't want to move because it's expensive. I don't want to write on a disk because it's expensive. I want to analyze everything in memory. Like, mm -hmm. does Lunar have this opportunity? We, we currently don't have a Spark implement, or the Apache, that kind of working model, but you can do work on uh, having data and run multiple instances of uh, processes to analyze the data. And you can probably set up the workflow for you to, to work on your kind of model. But, 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 but where is your data? Is that located in, in the s somewhere? Or you? So it's on different machines. Okay. Like, and uh, it's so big that it's uh, sort of impossible to move. Okay. Uh, and I don't want to write on the disk, like, Had like Hadoop does. Mm. It writes on, on, on a disk, mm. uh, MapReduce, like this Google MapReduce, it writes on a disk, but uh, sort of a big data uh, trend currently, the analysis, is mm. that you don't write on the disk because mm. it's becoming more and more impossible, but you analyze everything on, in memory. Yeah. And, and, and the memory, I, I, I think it's an issue for Lunar, or isn't it? Uh, the, uh, Depends on what kind of, we have special, uh, different kinds of resources at Lunar, but the resource we have from SNCC is uh, bit memory is 64 gigabytes per server. But we have servers with uh, up to 768 gigabytes. And also, if you have a special need or funding, we can set it up for you to, to get the kind of resource you need. 
Uh, and uh, so, so we have several projects coming in that kind of uh, we set up uh, tailored solutions for your workflow. And that includes uh, compute servers with more memory and also storage if you need, but you, need, <laughs> you want to have it in memory, but uh, also storage. Uh, I have a comment on the previous question about uh, uh, data, what happens to data if somebody dies or moves or whatever. So actually, Lund University has developed a, a data uh, management policy, which will uh, mm. become uh, uh, available or, or will be applied very soon. And that will actually uh, describe the different responsibilities of the uh, who is it possible on, on what and uh, how this goes and how the data which in few years time have to be stored at least for 10 years. So how that is done and who is responsible for it. Um, I think Ross Church, um, Astronomy and Theoretical Physics. I, I think this is a very welcome and important um, development. Um, I was wondering what sort of scale of ambition are you looking at, both in terms of the volume of data and how long long-term storage is? Long-term, I think it's, there is a 10-year something uh, first step, but the volume, that, that has to be figured out. I mean, we, we know we have, uh, at, at least at uh, Lunar, one petabyte something, uh, which is used as data that is lying there that needs to be moved somewhere. So that is one volume. But I imagine that there are several other places where there are data. So we have to be able to kind of make an assessment of how much data there is and, and what is needed to be stored later on as well. So I don't have a, but it's clear number now, but I mean, it's multiple petabytes, I would say. Okay, other? Any more questions? It looks like no. Then let's thank Yunus again. Mm -hmm.